Happy Friday! Welcome back to Drinking by My Shelf. My name is Emma and this is Balancing the Books. If you're new here, Balancing the Books is the game I play every month where I add up all the books that came onto my TBR with all the books that went off my TBR and try and make those numbers balance. And this video is being sponsored by Blinkist, an app that I will tell you about a little bit later in the video. I think you will agree when you hear more about them that it's like they were literally made for me. But before we get to them, let's dive into balancing the books. So I finished at the end of April with 36 books on my TBR. And then throughout the month of May, that number grew. Not gonna lie, I did a lot more book hauling than I did book reading. I will say, just because I know some of you were nervous about it, you may have seen my video that was called An Emotional Book Haul, where I hauled like 50 books. I hauled 30 Winnie the Pooh books, 20 something Famous Five books, and eight Brambley Hedge books. So we're talking more like 60 books. Those are not going on to my TBR. Those are not counting for balancing the books. So do not worry. Those are like childhood favorites. They're being added to my collection. They are not going on my to read as soon as I can trolley. They're more like lifelong collector's items. So <laughs> please don't make me add 60 books to this TBR because I would have to get rid of literally everything else. But onto the books that I did haul, I hauled this book, Quarantine Comics by Rachel Smith. I was actually sent this one by the publisher in exchange for an honest review and I loved it. So it's a memoir of life in lockdown and it's a collection of little comic strips and some full page pictures like this about Rachel's life in lockdown. It kind of goes from from when everything hits in March, I think like to to Christmas. I can't remember exactly where it goes to, but I really enjoyed it. It was a fun mix of some things that were just so incredibly, like seemingly universal experiences that we all had in lockdown, and some that were really just insights specifically to Rachel's life. And Rachel is not an artist that I was familiar with at all, so you don't need to know her before. I now follow her on Instagram, but I hadn't before. But I just really liked her as a character in this book. I liked learning about her and her boyfriend, her and her roommates, her best friend who kind of stopped by to take her out for walks each day. And it's also about her mental health. So as someone who I have made a secret of the fact has been struggling a little bit with my own mental health, I really enjoyed her visualizations of what well, you can see on the cover here. This is the mean black dog that represents her depression. Uh, he's called Barky. He's an imaginary dog that represents Rachel's depression and pessimism. He tells Rachel to do stupid things and he's kind of a dick. And then she also has a little white dog called Friendly, another imaginary dog, who represents Rachel's common sense and optimism. And I really liked that imagery. I personally have a real little black dog curled in the corner there who is not a symbol of depression. She's a symbol of joy and sweetness. Uh, so I'm not viewing mine as a black dog like this, but I really liked the imagery. There were quite a few times in here that I literally just took a picture of the page and sent it to my friends because it was just so perfect. It was like it was a picture of us. Then I hauled this beautiful thing, The Ophelia Girls by Jane Healy. So this is one from the publishing house where I work. Jane Healy is the author of The Animals at Lockwood Manor, which I read last year or whenever it came out. Uh, this is her latest book coming out this summer, comes out in July, and it's set between the 70s and the 90s. So in the 70s, it's about a group of teenagers who are obsessed with pre-Raphaelite paintings and kind of recreating them, like reenacting them, especially the drowning Ophelia, that being an image that they're particularly obsessed with. And then we also follow one of them, Ruth, 20 years later in the 90s when she has a daughter of her own uh, who has been very, very ill and one of Ruth's friends from the past comes back into their life. It's described here as a visceral, heady exploration of illicit desire, infatuation, and the perils and power of being a young woman. So, sounds right up my alley, and I love this cover. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I also love the American cover that looks very, very different, and kind of the combination of these two covers made me so intrigued to pick this up because they're going for very different vibes, and any book that can combine both of those vibes, I'm into it. 
Another one from my office, I hauled Of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. So this is about five generations of Cuban women who are all linked by a book that they pass down through the generations. And there's a little affirmation scrawled in the book that says, what does it say? <laughs> we are force, we are more than we think we are, which I just love. That's such a powerful quote to write down. So we kind of go all the way back to 1866, all the way through to present day and jump around between the lives of these five different women. Once again, this is a very Emma book. I hauled this one from work, Catch the Rabbit by Lana Bastersheets. Again, this sounds fab. It's about two women who are childhood friends, but they had drifted. They haven't seen each other for years, but they reunite for a road trip. And each chapter is apparently told between two different time zones. So we get the present day and then we flash back to a shared experience of these two girls and kind of see how they remember the past differently. Also another like gorgeous cover, love all the colours there and when you get it naked, like hello bright blue, hello bright orange insides, hello bright pink here, just wonderful. And then as you may have seen, I reread A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. This doesn't actually do anything to help my balancing the book's numbers because it wasn't on my TBR trolley because I'd already read it. Uh, but yeah, I did reread it. I did film myself rereading it and I did cry a lot, which I wasn't expecting because I've read this book before. I didn't cry last time round. I did think it was very, very sad, but I'm just not really a crier. Uh, but this time around it just really affected me uh, and I won't tell you the whole thing because I've told you in incredible detail in that video which I will link to if you want to go and watch it. It is like a full spoiler video, I tell you everything that happens so if you've always kind of been intrigued by a little life but you didn't want to read it yourself you can go and check it out. Um, essentially it's about a man who has suffered extreme trauma uh, that he's unable to recover from and it's about his relationships, his friendships, uh, the man who is the love of his life, the man who becomes his father figure and actually officially adopts him. And it's just, it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's not for everyone. It's very upsetting. Go and watch the video if you want to know more. Okay, the next thing I read was on Blinkist. So this is where I'm gonna tell you about this month's sponsors. If you've watched this channel for a while, you may have heard me say before that I struggle a little bit with nonfiction. I love the idea of it. I love learning new ideas. I love learning new ways to back up the arguments that I feel really passionately about. But often, I can't keep my focus for a whole nonfiction book. I think it was even like literally last month's Balance of the Books where I summed up the entire nonfiction genre as this could have been an email this could have been an email. A very sweeping statement, I know, but as a rule, I have struggled to focus on a lot of non-fiction books. Blinkist is an app where you can find a huge, huge library of non-fiction titles condensed into blinks. So they are little 15 minute reads, or you can listen to them as audiobooks and they give you the key ideas from these books. It is literally everything I have been wanting my whole life. What I think is really cool about it is you can learn your information really, really quickly, which I love as someone who's a bit impatient. You've got such a big range of titles in there and you do also have the option, at the end of reading the Blinks, you do have the option to buy the full book. So you can kind of use it as like a try before you buy system if that's how you want to do it. I honestly am just using it as like my entire access to non-fiction. I feel like it's opened up the doors for me finally. So I have been reading loads of books. I've been reading books that my therapist recommended to me that I'd been kind of putting off because I was like, these sound like good ideas, but I just don't want to read the whole book. So I read I'm Okay, You're Okay by Thomas Harris, which is basically about transactional analysis. So it's this idea that all of us have inside us uh, a child, a parent and an adult and depending on the different ways that we interact with people it's kind of a different version of ourselves that come out and often when we're the child or the parent we're kind of reacting in defensive ways or ways that just aren't helpful for us and it sort of shows you how to access your inner adult who is just able to make good decisions for yourself and look after yourself uh, and then a similar one on that theme is games people play by i need to look up the author's name 
Eric Byrne. His name is Eric Byrne. Uh, that one was, yeah, similar on there, but it kind of went into more detail about some of the particular interactions that are quite common with each other. That one is definitely of its time. Like, my therapist had warned me. It is a little dated in some of the situations that it comes up with. Uh, but the idea at its core is really, really interesting. I've also been reading Sapiens. Like, everyone loves Sapiens. Everyone had been talking about that book and I felt really left out. And now, finally, I've been reading it. I also saw a book on there called How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds. I really want that one because that's a skill I need. I hate meeting new people. I find it so stressful. You get stuff like um, Michelle Obama's autobiography is on there. Honestly, it's amazing. You also have little podcasts on there called Shortcasts. So if you're like doing the washing up or sweeping the floor, you can just put it in your earphones and listen to a little short version and get like as much information as possible in that time. Fantastic. Like I said, it's like they've been watching my videos and thought this is what Emma needs because she can't pay attention to non-fiction apparently for longer than 15 minutes. 15 minutes is perfect. And of course, I wouldn't tell you all about this if I didn't have a special deal for you to use. So if you click the link in my description, that gives you access to a seven day free trial of Blinkist and then 25% off a premium membership. So I'm absolutely loving it and I can't wait to get all your recommendations for the other books that you think I should read on there. Okay, so that was my therapy books. The next book that I read was Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. I read this one for my book club with my offline friends. Uh, and I didn't like it. And I'm so sorry because this book has been so beloved. And I don't know if it was just because I wasn't in the mood when I read it, but I didn't connect with it at all. And I was like the only one. Basically, everyone else in my book club said that they had cried so much at this book. They found it like so incredibly moving. And I just didn't connect. I didn't engage at all. So this is the story of Shakespeare's family. Shakespeare himself is never mentioned by name in the book, but he is very much in it. He's just always called the husband, the father, the tutor. Like they just never say his name. This book is mostly about his wife, Agnes. I always knew her name was Anne Hathaway, uh, but apparently like her full name was Agnes. Uh, and then also their children, Particularly, they had they had an older daughter, Susanna, and then they had twins, Hamnet and Judith. Hamnet was the boy, and when he was 11 or so, he died. So that's all true. That's all, like, in historical record. And this book is a fictionalised telling of that story. And it incorporates a sort of ambiguous magical element, which I just didn't get on with. <laughs> Sometimes I love ambiguous magic, but in this one... I don't know, it didn't work for me. I think because I knew it was historical fiction, I knew it was about Shakespeare, I don't know very much about Shakespeare, I haven't really read any of his plays and I don't know much about the history, but I obviously know he was real. And so suddenly having this book be like, oh yeah, this is Shakespeare's wife, she's a witch. I was like, mm, I don't think she was. But mostly my main problem was that I just didn't connect with any of the characters. And so when the son died, which is obviously this tragic thing, I didn't personally feel anything which is not a great sign. Plus, I've been in a bad mood this whole month, so possibly I was just being really grumpy when I read it. Okay, then another book haul. I got sent four books by Verso Books, so let's go through them. Firstly, I got a non-fiction book. I know I just said I don't read non-fiction, but I'm gonna try. This is A World Without Police by Geo Maher, How Strong Communities Make Cops Obsolete. Uh, and as you may know, because I've talked about it before, I like really strongly agree with this. I really would love to see a world without police and without prisons, um, but I don't have the words and knowledge to articulate that or to argue that properly. And so I'm really interested to read this and learn a lot more because there's a lot more that I need to know. I have a lot of gaps in my knowledge there. They also sent me Terminal Boredom, which is a collection of short stories by Azumi Suzuki, which is funny because I literally had only just heard of this book like a week before they emailed me asking if I wanted it. So it felt perfect. It's described as seven punky and pitch black stories offer English language readers an overdue introduction to Izumi Suzuki, a cult figure in Japanese literature. So it's translated stories. I have like loved so many books I've read translated from Japanese. I don't know what it is specifically because obviously you can't like generalize Japanese fiction. Uh, but maybe I've just had really good luck, but I have loved every book I've read translated from Japanese, so 
I feel like that's a good omen for this one. They sent me Paradise Rot by Jenny Haval. Uh, this one I actually saw on Sophie's channel from Portal and the Pages a while ago, like a couple of years ago, I think she talked about it. And I put it down on my Goodreads like to read list at the time, but I hadn't got around to buying it yet. So that was perfect. So this one she described, I think this was in her video that was like dark books by women. I think it was in that video. So of course, I was interested. It's a heady and hypersensual portrayal of sexual awakening and queer desire. Fantastic. And then the last one they sent me was a book I had never heard of before, Long Live the Post Horn by Vigdis Hjorf. So this is another novel. Filled with existential yearning, Long Live the Post Horn is a novel about loneliness, love, letters, and the people who deliver them. So you get a really nice book haul from a publisher there. Then I read this book, The Last House on Needless Street by Katrina Ward. Again, this was a book that was sent to me by the publisher in exchange for an honest review. Uh, and I have a mixed review for this one. This has had such incredible reviews and ratings from so many people, and it just didn't quite do it for me. But I have been thinking about it a lot since I read it. And once I figured out what the book was doing, I loved the idea. I loved the aim of the book, I loved the message of the book, I just didn't enjoy the reading experience of the book personally. So, um, can, what can I tell you without spoilers? This book seems at first like it's a horror story, but it turns out to be something much sadder and much more interesting than that. I'm going to try and be as vague as I can because it is a very twisty book. I did guess the twists, most of them, a little bit ahead, um, but you know, I still don't want to ruin the experience for anyone, but I will say it is about, I appreciated that it was about something that I have only ever seen portrayed before in a very, very different light, uh, and the author here clearly had actually researched, well I know she did because she wrote in her author's note about it, she had actually researched this concept and so was defying the stereotypes that are so often put on this concept and actually creating something much more real and loving and sympathetic. So I really, really appreciated that aspect. And like I said, I've kept thinking about this book. I've been really, really interested ever since. So it's not like I wouldn't recommend it. It's just that I was just a little bit too baffled for a little bit too much of the reading experience. I got to the point where I was just not interested in turning the pages because it had gone too long of me being like, I don't know what's going on here, I'm tapping out, you know what I mean? Having said that, I'm kind of interested in rereading it now that I know what's going on to see if I find the experience very different. But it is written in a weird way and I'm just not sure that that weird style is quite my style. Then I borrowed three ebooks from library services, uh, and you will have seen all of those in my love hate challenge, or you can see all of those now, that video is, is up now. Uh, I did the next installment of the love hate challenge with Emma Tobias, this one was two truths and a lie. So we actually set each other three books to read, and we told each other why we loved all three, but one of those sentences was a lie, one of the books we actually hated. So I read in that video the book Meant To Be by Lauren Morrill, uh, Hex Hall by Rachel Hawkins, I'm kind of making these names up, I'm not sure if they're right, <laughs> and what was another one I read? A Spy In The House by Y.S. Lee. I actually DNF'd that one, but all three of them have now been returned, so they're off <laughs> my TBR. You can watch my entire reading vlog experience of them in that video, so I won't go into much detail here, but I didn't really like any of them. <laughs> I thought Meant To Be was completely rubbish, like, not like other girls' YA story. I thought The Hex Hall was fun, actually. I did enjoy that one. It's about a witch school, uh, and then I DNF'd a spy in the house because it was so boring. It was historical fiction about a spy, and, like, I honestly don't give a shit. Then I hold four mystery books, and this video is coming very soon. Some of you will know what these are because it's not a complete secret, I did post them on my Instagram. Uh, but yeah, I hauled four mystery books from a box of stories, which is a subscription box service, and I'll tell you more about them in that video. Uh, and I am only keeping one of them, and you will find out which one in the video. So that's one book to add to my TBR there. 
And then I finally stopped buying books and I just read some that were on my TBR already. So I read Hostage by Claire McIntosh, which was one of my five star predictions and ultimately was disappointing. It wasn't a five star read for me. I did enjoy it. It was very, very page turning. It's basically a story of a hostage situation on an aeroplane. So absolutely terrifying. The main character is an air hostess called Mina who is working on this flight that is hijacked. Uh, so we get her perspective, we also get mini perspectives from various people on the plane who become significant, we also get the perspective of her husband at home who is having his own drama going on there, and ultimately there was just too much going on. I think the stuff on the plane was more fun, the side storyline with the husband just felt a little bit too much, but a little too overdramatic and a bit silly considering that it actually didn't really add anything and wasn't really that interesting. Claire McIntosh was one of my like favourite author by authors just from her first two books alone. I gave both of them five stars, they were phenomenal thrillers and ever since then I have read three more of her books including this one and they've all been three stars. So it's such a shame because I loved her so much. This one was fun though, I actually would recommend this if you're looking for a like page turning thriller that's really really gripping. I had a lot of fun while reading this and I read it very very quickly so I would absolutely recommend it. It's just I didn't think it was actually brilliant and I did think it was like there were some eye roll moments in it. There was also a couple of parts that I didn't think she handled very sensitively. She was portraying perspectives from a lot of different characters which is really cool but there are a couple of characters, one in particular that I didn't think was sensitive at all. I think she was drawing on stereotypes rather than a real person's experience. Then I read The Dead Girls by Jorge Ibargo and Goitia. This one, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you may have seen. I think this was the third time that I hauled it. So I got given it by a colleague and then I gave it to a charity and then I took it home from the office one day but then I decided not to read it so I gave it to someone else and then a third time I took it home from the office and was like this actually looks really good, I should read it. So I finally read it and yeah it was really good, I really liked it. It's based on a true story about these two sisters who owned a brothel and actually it was revealed were murdering women and like tens of bodies were found buried in the back garden. So it's a horrific story. This is based on that, it's a fictionalised version and it's told as if it's a police report. It's described as a black comedy uh, and I guess it is, um, but it's not like funny, you know, it's horrific stuff in that, but it is, it's told in quite a deadpan way that does add a certain very, very subtle level of humour to it, but it's not like hilarious. I think I enjoyed the first like three quarters of it a lot more than the final quarter. It didn't quite go where I thought it was going to go and it didn't quite delve in as deeply as I thought it was going to at the end. I guess by nature of it being written as a police report that works for so much of the book and is actually like adds this kind of sinister layer to it. The fact that you're so detached from the character's emotions worked really well but then by the end left me a little bit wanting more. And then finally on the last day of the month I finished reading Little Sons by Zarks Nda which I really really liked. <laughs> All three of these last ones by the way were for a word associations game that I have been doing so you can see my reading experience in a vlog. There are more books in that vlog but we hit the end of the month so the rest of them you'll have to wait until next month's balance of the books for. Uh, but Little Sons, I say in that vlog that I was so surprised how much I liked this one because it is historical fiction which isn't always my favourite and it is written in a at times very detached style. You don't spend that much time like really exploring the characters emotions. So it's a lot of things that I don't love in books. It's also written almost as if it's non-fiction. So it is based on true events and it tells you a lot of information. It reads at parts like a textbook. All of these things on paper are things that I would not want to read but I was hooked. I really really enjoyed this. It's set in the late 19th century, very early 20th century in South Africa. The true story is the assassination of Hamilton Hope who was a British magistrate coloniser uh, but it also weaves in this fictional love story. So our main character is a man called Malangana 
who I don't think is a real historical figure, but maybe he was, maybe the name is real. Uh, and it's about his love story with the woman that he loves but is torn apart from and he spends 20 years searching for her. Uh, and it was it was really sweet and it was really beautiful and I loved learning about the time period that I knew literally nothing about this part of history. Uh, so it really opened my eyes to some things. So where does that leave us? I think I am still three books up before my books are balanced. I need to get rid of three more. Damn it. I knew that would happen. I got too excited hauling books this month. You know what I'm gonna do? Is I'm gonna look on Blinkist. Because <laughs> I have some non-fiction books here that have been on this trolley for years. And I keep not getting rid of them because I'm really interested. But, you know, I also keep not picking them up because... I don't pick up non-fiction very much. So for example, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. Love that title. Uh, am I gonna actually read the book? Is it gonna be very complicated economics? Let's see if it's on here. I honestly would not be surprised. They have so much. <gasps> it's here! Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence. I can read it in 19 minutes. Someone from my local charity shop is gonna learn a lot about how to have better sex. Okay, one down, two to go. Another non-fiction that I have, that I actually hauled last year, but I haven't read it partly because it's non-fiction and partly because it's an ebook, and I like, so rarely actually remember to pick up my e-reader, uh, is The End of Policing. So I just hauled that other book about policing. Uh, I am interested in both of them. Oh my God, The End of Policing is on here as an audio book, fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to unhaul the end of policing. I don't need that one hanging about my e-reader anymore. I'm going to never pick it up. Just need to get rid of one more book. Oh, but I don't want to. All of these look so nice. It's extra difficult now because I recently did that try a chapter video where I read the first chapter of basically everything on here and then actively decided to keep it. So I know I don't want to give any of that away. So... Okay, the other option I have, we do have a special bonus rule where if I really can't give up any of these books, I am allowed to put a book into purgatory. I don't get to choose the book, it has to be the oldest book on my TBR. I can put it in purgatory for a month, basically it means I have to read it within the month and if I don't, then it has to go. The choice is out of my hands. So I know that the oldest book on my TBR is another Persephone classic. I think I've only got one, or I've got two left. I've got a short story collection and I've got a novel called A Lady and Her Husband. I'll go get it. Here it is, A Lady and Her Husband by Amber Reeves. So this one I believe is about a woman who goes to work with her husband and discovers that his workers are being really underpaid and unfairly treated and it kind of puts a strain on their marriage her like fighting for their rights, that's what I think it's about, which sounds great, and I really, really don't want to unhaul it, so that means I'm going to have to read it next month, which is going to be difficult because I already have a lot of reading plans for next month. <sighs> we'll check back in this time in July and see how I got on. Fingers crossed I managed to read it because I really don't want to get rid of it. I mean, I will just make myself make time to read it. So once again, thank you so much to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. And like I said, do click the link in the description box below for a seven day free trial plus 25% off a premium membership. I think they're fantastic and I think you will too. And leave me a sunshine emoji in the comments below to celebrate the fact that summer is finally arriving. See you next time.